Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. Live from Beijing, China, is a nation of immigrants. A bi-weekly talk show program featuring the lives of immigrants and the descendants of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion, created by Think Tank Hawaii and Kingsfield Law Office. I'm absolutely thrilled today to have our guest, my mentor and professor, Meredith McQuaid, Associate Vice President and Dean of International Programs at the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Dean McQuaid. Welcome, Dean McQuaid. So happy to have you today. Thank you, Chang. It is just delightful to be here, and it's wonderful to see you again. Thank you so much. I first met you during a campus tour at Mingdao Hall in the summer of 2003, when Professor David introduced me to you and informed you that I had been just admitted to the University of Minnesota Law School. The tour and the meeting with you persuaded me to turn off other offers and accept your offer. One of the best decisions I have ever made in my life. When I first began my legal education at the U of M Law School, you were the Dean of Students and Professor for Inter Introduction to American Law. You have been my professor, my dean, supervisor, supervisor, mentor, and our leader for the past 20 years. I learned so much from you, Dean McQuaid, including diligence, confidence, perseverance, and loyalty. I want to take this opportunity to thank you once more to everything you have done for the University of Minnesota, for us, and for all the community. Thank you so much. You have been a role model and an excellent leader for all of us. Thank you, Chang. It's very flattering and very kind of you to say. I've had a great career, and part of the Wonder of my job has been meeting wonderful immigrants like yourself. So thank you for that introduction. Thank you very much. I'm very proud to be your student. And today it is an absolutely privilege and honor to interview you for the talk show. You know, the talk show is called A Nation of Immigrants, but we do interview a lot of descendants of immigrants. And you have a very long, you, have, you are a native of Minnesota and you have a long career with a higher education. And I please allow me just to read a short bio your assistant sent to me. You have served, Dean McQuaid have ser served with the dictation at the University of Minnesota for decades. Dean McQuaid has been the university's senior international officer since 2007. Under her leadership, global programs and a strategic alliance staff have collaborated broadly to inspire students' engagement and to advance innovative initiatives uniting us all in the work of internationalization. Dean McQuaid's work at the University of Minnesota has been enhanced through her positions at professional organizations, including the president of NASA, Association of International Educators, board member and a committee chair of Internet Association of International Education Administrators, Chair of the Senior International Officer Groups of the Big Ten Academic Alliance and a Consultant on Internationalization for American Council on Education. This is a ver just a very, very brief version of your, your bio. If we have to read your bio, we're going to take the entire 30 minutes of the show time. But uh, I, I believe that our, our audience already get the impression that you have been an international educator all of your career. You have worked with many, many uh, students, uh, scholars, and academic staff from all over the world. But my first question to you, Dean McQuaid, is uh, you are native of Minnesota. You have uh, received education and you worked in Minnesota. The how, do you know how your ancestors settled in Minnesota? Did they settle in Minnesota or other parts of the country first? Well, my family, um, I must admit, we're not very good about tracing our genealogy, but 
My mother was born in Frazee, Minnesota, which is pretty much the mm. middle of the state um, near um, up near Park Rapids in that area. And her um, heritage is one half German and one mm. half Irish. And both of those immigrant immigrant groups uh, contributed a lot to the development of Minnesota. I know Minnesota is known for having more of the Scandinavian immigrants, but there were mm. many Irish and many German as well. My yes. father's family is 100% Irish, and it was his my my father's grandfather, my great grandfather, that immigrated from Ireland. And my father's entire family uh, grew up in New Hampshire, and they were all newspaper men in those days. All of the men were in the newspaper business, and uh, my father was as well. When he married my mom and moved to Minnesota to be with her, he began working for the uh, what was then just the Minneapolis Tribune. Uh, and he was mm. employed by the newspaper all his all of his life, uh, all of his all of his professional life. So um, yes, my I'm a Minnesotan through and through, but Jap uh, German and Irish heritage. Thank you so much for sharing. I think one of the best uh, reason Minnesota is such a well-run state is we have a lot of a lot of uh, German, you know, descendants. It's a it's Super technical, super scientific. The, the state is very well managed. The university is well managed. Thank you very much. And could you, so you grew up in Minnesota. Could you tell us a little bit about your childhood and schooling in, in the state? Sure, I'd be happy to. I'm, um, I'm fifth in a family of eight children. So my parents married and had four children before me, and then there were um, three more after me. Um, we were lower middle class. Uh, my father was a newspaper man, as I mentioned. My mother was busy raising those eight children, so didn't actually go to work until most of us were out of high school. Um, I went to a very small Catholic school for my first six years of, of primary education and then public school. I graduated from the University of Minnesota with a linguistics degree, and then I went on to law school, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, it was all very local, and I feel so fortunate to have had good teachers. And despite the fact that we had a large family without much money, um, I, I, have a, I have very fond memories of my childhood. Um, I grew up, there wasn't much money, but there was a lot of love and a very um, great emphasis on education. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You have been... After school, you have began to work and you went to law school. You have a very long career in education. And could you just summarize the path you took to go to the, the position you hold today? Sure. Um, you know, I'm often asked because, as you point out, I have a long biography because I'm just getting older. Um, but I'm often right. asked by young people how I got to this position uh, which is both extremely rewarding, um, but also relatively high within the administration. So I went, to, I graduated with a linguistics degree from the University of Minnesota, as I mentioned. And when I was um, nearing the end, of maybe a senior end of my junior year, the University of Minnesota announced that it was launching the first program in Chinese for undergraduate students in Tianjin at Nan Kaidashui. And um, this was a brand new opportunity. There had been no Americans into China since prior to Mao assuming leadership of the country. And so this was a great opportunity to see China at a time when few Americans had. It wasn't very expensive. It was for a summer where we would go and learn Chinese in a very intense environment. And I put the money together and I joined the program and it truly did change my life. I came back then and finished my linguistics degree, and then I uh, moved to Japan. I wanted to learn both Chinese and Japanese, and with my linguistics degree, it was pretty easy for me to get a job teaching English. So I lived in Tokyo from 1983 to 1986, and then when I left Japan, I took a 13,000 mile or 13 month trip, 36,000 kilometer trip around the world by motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I came back to Minnesota in about January of 1987, and I started law school in 1988. And with all of that experience of crossing borders and living in countries, crossing countries, 
um, customs, um, what's required to enter a country, leave a country. I became very interested in immigration law. And so following law school, I did practice immigration law for about four years. And then I was hired by the University of Minnesota Law School to be its first international program officer. Um, and so that was a first, first career. That, that was the first time anyone had been hired in that role at the law school. It's always exciting to be the first to do a job because you get to design it yourself. And then, so I did that job for 15 years. And then this senior international officer position opened up the job I now have, a brand new position. It was one of the first universities in the country to have such a position. Now almost every university has the equivalent of me. Uh, and so I took that job 15 years ago. And um, it's just been, I have to say, I've I've been extremely fortunate to have opportunities that I was also um, pretty excited to just try something new. And I often tell young people that, that if you, you know, even if you have a career path in mind, you ought to keep your options open and take chances um, because they just might lead to a whole new um, opportunity that you had never previously even imagined. Wonderful, thank you so much. I think Kenjin was very fortunate to have you China was very fortunate to have you, U of M, law school, and we, the international students, are extremely fortunate to have you as our mentor. But for today, I sent the poster, this program poster, to some Chinese alumni, alum uh, groups. And then I hear everybody says, oh, say hi to Dean McQueen, and we love her. You know, it's so heartwarming to see her to see her face again, and you are just to become the symbol for our American experience. You know, many international students come first came to the U of M and to the law school. The, the first person they knew was you, and you they, you taught them law, you taught them American culture, you taught them American history and uh, professionalism, everything. So it's just. Uh, we could have thank you enough for you to do the internationalization, not only for the U of M and the community, but also for the students, international students, for them to be truly uh, understand American culture and American law and American education. Thank you very much. I'm extremely glad to here you talk about the immigration law priorities. Uh, and this program is a nation of immigrants. And uh, you uh, practice law after law school. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, what your immigration law priorities, mainly employment-based, family-based? It's a asylum-related or refugee-related, or uh, so which area you, you focus on and which part of the immigration law priorities you enjoy? Well, I was so fortunate. I worked for a law firm that actually no longer exists now, but it had um, some of the best immigration lawyers in the country that were working here in the Twin Cities. And again, this was in the early 90s. And so because I, I was a, a new associate, I didn't have a lot of experience, I pretty much had this amazing opportunity to do a little bit of everything. I had the opportunity to do employment-based immigration. So we would work with Minnesota companies who were hiring talent from overseas. I often then worked to bring the spouses and children of those employees into Minnesota. I had the great fortune to work on some asylum applications, particularly for people from the Southeast Asian region, um, so some of the Hmong, some of the Laotian, I actually worked on behalf of a very young Chinese, he was 16 at the time, who was smuggled mm -hmm. over on a ship. And um, the, uh, the authorities found this group of young men that were being held against their will and forced to do a certain kind of work. Uh, we worked on an asylum case for that young man. Um, and so we got to see a little of everything. Um, I also did um, just insurance defense work, which is fun and interesting as a lawyer, but the more the better part of my practice was this range of immigration work that I was able to do, and it was extremely rewarding. Thank you so much. It's a, I practice immigration law uh, as well, and but I'm very 
uh, just, just only focus on employment based immigration. After hearing from you, I think I'm going to try other areas as well. I yeah. sounds, sounds please a lot please do. Fun. You just meet the nicest people who are hardworking mm -hmm. and want a new chance at, at life. Um, and so you'll hear great stories and just meet wonderful, um, enthusiastic people who, as you have already pointed out, typically make our country even better. Thank you very much. Thank you for saying that. Now, let's turn to education. And uh, you, as a senior international educator, uh, I have this question for you. And I, I, I myself is a teacher. I teach at U of M and other schools. And But I keep reading this uh, uh, theory about the new skills the student need to function in the 21st century, the so-called four Cs. The creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. And unfortunately, none of the C's we can really teach to the students. The students have to work hard to figure that out. And what's your view as a senior educator? And what do the student need to uh, function and to be a professional in the 21st century? And how? what are the essential skills for the students? not only American students, but international students as well, in your view? You know, it's a great question, and, and it's really true that um, what we often teach in the classroom, you know, from primary school upward, are sort of the facts and the, the, the um, non rights, the left side of the brain activity. So that is the analytical, the logical. Now, of course, if you go into design or any kind of graphic arts, um, you won't necessarily be focused only on logic um, or, or, or um, sort of uh, linear thinking. But for most of us, um, we're raised to really learn the practical side, and that's what school teaches us, and that's what we get tested on. But there's this great book that I often refer to, and it's by Daniel Pink. I really, I recommend this to all the young people I know. I um, his he's written many books. This one is A Whole New Mind. And his theory is that as society progresses, as a country like the United States has moved through the industrial age into what we have now, that the left brain skills really can be learned by people all over the world. That's why many of our jobs have left the United States. But the right brain skills are the ones that we need to practice and be good at. So, for example, he says it's not necessary. It, it's not enough to just learn argument, which is good for lawyers. But you also have to learn how to tell a story. So. It's we need to learn the essence of persuasion and communication in order to move people to our side. And the, his biggest point, I think, is this idea about um, that it's not just logic that we need to learn, but empathy. So that even though if we feel that um, logic can is all we need to make a decision, we also have to learn how to share that knowledge with people in a way that they can appreciate. And his final point, I won't say much more about this, his final point is that we also learn to know why things matter to people. What, what is it about a particular activity or object that brings meaning to someone's life? And that meaning could be different between you and me and a third person. But those are the skills that we must just encourage young people to consider as they age. So high school, college, um, postgraduate, all of the things that make us human and make our lives more interesting are not necessarily what's taught in books. And so we need to work together. As you say, not much of this can be taught, but we can put people in situations and ask them to consider what it means to be um, persuasive or how to tell a story instead of just present facts. And I think all of that is really relevant to preparing students for the future. Beautifully said, Democrat. I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, looking at the AI and looking at the, the current discussion about AI replacing the you know, human being and even in education, and I see, I feel something was missing, the discussion was missing with empathy. And I'm glad you, you pointed that out. And the, the 21st century and uh, previously as well, the empathy is a very big part 
of human communication, and it's vitally important for people to to understand each other and to probably not necessarily love each other, but not not hate each other. And the immigration law, I think that uh, when the students asked me about AI replacing law law practice, I said I don't see that going to happen. You know, it's uh, it, even some parts, some procedure might be replaced, but uh, constitutional law, immigration law, and even other parts of the law, the criminal law, and it need a tremendous amount of empathy to for the client and the professional to communicate. So that's I do not think that it will. The AI can gain empathy in any time. So, thank you so much for your for your insights. Uh, since I'm a, I was a law student of youth, and uh, I went to the same law school uh, and, uh, as you went to, and the law school is a very that's our, that's us, you know, almost twenty <laughs> years ago. <laughs> you were my dean, the dean of the internet, uh, dean of the students at the law school. I was your student. And uh, you haven't changed a bit. You, know, <laughs> you, you, you well, have a little, little bit. Yeah. It seems like just yesterday, Chang, to be honest. I remember yeah. the day very well. Yep. Exactly. I remember that. That was uh, at, uh, at the uh, Science Museum, I believe. Uh, when I was a law student, a law, law student, and uh, uh, you taught us how to be professional, how to understand, memorize the black light law, and how to fund the law. And how to think like a lawyer. Uh, there was a book about legal education called The Purpose of Legal Education is to preserve the status quo and perpetrate the hierarchy. In law school, we are very conservative, even we are progressive. But the purpose of legal education is to preserve the current status, current system, is not to revolutionize it, not to radicalize it, and not to overthrow it. So now we get to the bigger question, what do you think is the purpose of education and uh, or the purpose of legal education in your view? And I honestly, I can't understand this question. I don't, I don't think I have an answer to as for the purpose of education. What do you think, Democrat? Well, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, I don't know that law school education is designed to preserve the status quo. I think it in law school, we learn what the status quo is. We learn how we got to it, particularly as we look to precedents under common law. We can see the evolution of an idea or an attitude, say, for example, for uh, the in, uh, enfranchisement of women, uh, the enfranchisement of Black people. Uh, actually, all people of color, because so much of the property and and um, and rights, all rights were were really given only to white men. And so we learn what the status quo is and how we got there. But I think um, law students are encouraged to be disruptors in the sense that working mm -hmm. within a system, we can actually change it. We have to know the basis for where how we got here, but we also know that step by step we can make changes in the law that positively influence society. I think some non-lawyers may perceive us as conservative because things take so long, but things take long, th change takes a long time when we're talking about the legal system because its impact is so great. And so I think those kinds of changes can't be done quickly because it needs so much, we need to really, um, sort of, it can't move until society is ready for it to move. And so it's mm -hmm. both the societal pressures that come from all kinds of um, sources. And then there's the legal element. And those two things really have to intersect. And then we can sort of ratchet society forward. Um, you know, sometimes it's up one step forward, two steps back. But lawyers have the capacity to um, positively influence the law that is the construction of our civil society. And so I think there's a, a way to be um, positive and um, kind disruptors in changing the status quo, but in a way that's at a pace that people can tolerate. I love the word you use, kind in disruptors. Mm -hmm. You have to be part of the system in order to change it. I right. think we are quite fortunate 
who live and function in a system who allow this kind of change in Minnesota and in the United States. And the other system, not so much. Thank you very much. We are towards the end, uh, the, 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 the end part of our program, but there are a few questions I do want to ask you. You first visit Tianjin, one of my favorite cities in China, and I was walking in the British concession last week. I absolutely love it. See the European architectures and uh, Astor Hotel, first uh, British hotel built by the, 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 the uh, settlers in 1862. Just to think about it. Uh, so you, you first visited China and Tianjin in 1980s. When was your last time you visited China? Um, so within my capacity as the senior international officer for the University of Minnesota, I went in 2018. Uh, mm -hmm. We took a number of deans with us, the dean of the College of Liberal Arts and the dean of the Humphrey Institute of Public Affairs, and visited a number of the top universities in China, both uh, universities that we had relationships with to introduce these deans, and then other universities that we wanted to have relationships with. So that was a fabulous trip. And then I went in 2019, and that was yeah. to talk with the Hanban um, about our Confucius Institute closing. So those were my last two trips. And then there was another trip. Ready. We were ready to go on another trip in 2021 or 2022 yeah. when COVID hit. So um, I haven't been back since. And it makes me sad because um, I've had just so many experiences in China. And as I've already said, my experience there in 1980 was was had a huge impact on my life. And so I have a great fondness in my heart for China and the Chinese people. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. I can uh, uh, assure you that all of your students, not only LM students, JD mm -hmm. students at law school, but all U of M alum in China, thousands of them are waiting for you <laughs> to revisit. And you will receive the warmest welcome after the reopening of China. And uh, we, we, they're going to throw the best party for you. And please return at your convenience. Well, now the, a difficult question. Do you think you, 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 it's, uh, we cannot overly simplify the uh, U.S.-China relationship, but uh, it appears it's getting more and more difficult for collaboration and even ideas change. In the not only in the past few uh, during the COVID, but uh, generally speaking, for the past few years and a decade, do you think the golden age of education, collaboration, and uh, exchange between U.S. and China have already passed? Oh, Chang, I sure hope that's not true. Um, you know, if you look at the history of China and America and our relationship, I've, I've heard it referred to as frenemies, you know, the combination yes. of friend and enemy. Um, I think uh, both America and China need one another. And what our two governments do obviously has an impact on how the average citizen in each country can do to continue relationships. Mm -hmm. I don't think our current sort of Cold War or impasse that I think we seem to be living under will last forever. I don't know how long it'll last. But the thing I just always keep remembering is that education is the best form of soft diplomacy there is. Despite the impasse, we do have Chinese students and scholars still coming to the United States. And we do have U.S. students traveling again to China. And it's those daily experiences that those individuals will have that will have the long lasting effect. You know, to to think back to 1980, when I um, met my first Chinese friends and we would ride our bicycles at night to go out and get fried donuts, that is how I got to know the spirit of Chinese people. And as you said, all the Chinese people I've met both at the law school and now across the university, those individuals are having experiences that teach them what Americans are like, good and bad. 
what our society is like, good and bad. And it's those messages, those lessons people are going to remember long after they've gone back to pick up their careers in our respective countries. So um, there's definitely a slowdown in that relationship, but um, it won't last forever. And people like you and I have to really keep working to um, share what we know about one another's countries and people with everyone we know, our relatives, our friends, um, and to, to persuade people that our governments are not necessarily representative of the hearts and minds of their people. And um, any in any way we can share what we know about the people in each country, I think will help uh, towards breaking down this current situation. I think we have to be patient. Um, and I, th I think we have to hope for the best. I totally agree. Thank you very much. Very encouraging. And uh, I think this trip, this current trip I'm taking, I think some, I see some positive, you know, signals. So I, I oh, look good. forward to sharing with you when I return to the, to the States. I'm so uh, happy to we, hear that. Thank you. We normally conclude our show with two generic questions for our distinguished guests. One is what what do you think are some of the formative steps you took in your earlier days, in your teens and the 20s, to become you today? That's a hard question. I think that um, because I was uh, born in the middle of a large family, um, I was um, uh, encouraged to take risks. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't the oldest. I didn't have the big weight of that that often oldest children do. Um, I was smack in the middle of a tribe, a big, big group of kids. And so I was encouraged to try things without too much risk. I could always blame it on my brother. Um, and then as I got older, I really think just jumping at opportunities that appeared before me um, without, uh, you know, I think there's always an element of risk to any, any jumping at any opportunity. But if you give it as much thought as you can and in your gut, in your stomach, you feel like this is a good chance. It didn't fit into the plan you had, but here it is right before you. Um, I really think as a young person, before you've got, you know, house payments or or a spouse and children, I think if you if you have opportunities that feel like this is exciting and I can't think of a good reason not to do it, that you should do it. Um, they, these, these opportunities don't come along very often. Uh, and they will change your the trajectory of your life in small ways and in big ways. Important advice. Uh, you are the most adventurous people I ever know. <laughs> you know, I, we try to learn everything from you. You are a very disciplined, professional, big heart leader, but with an extremely adventurous spirit. Mm -hmm. We try to learn to be professional from your teaching. And uh, the advent adventure spirit part, it's very hard to learn, I'll be mm -hmm. honest. Final question, any particular book or movie that you're enjoying at the moment you want to recommend to our audience? Yeah, I, I, I just love to read. I read a lot. I read primarily nonfiction, but lately I've read some great novels as well. I will, again, recommend Daniel Pink's book, A Whole New Mind. Yes. It's old mm -hmm. now. It's like 2008, maybe. But the 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 message, the import of it remains. And I, I refer to it quite often, actually. I also mm -hmm. just finished an amazing book called Breath by James Nestor. I hope I got that right. Um, mm -hmm. About the importance of breathing correctly and how the way we breathe and how we breathe affects how we feel. Uh, it's really, uh, it was impactful. I'm going to read it a second time. Uh, I just finished a book called This is Happiness uh, by mm -hmm. Niall Williams, I think an Irish novelist. And it is one of the most beautiful stories I've ever read. Um, and his writing's incredible. So I could go on. Honestly, I just, I just love to read. Um, and I do think one of the ways I learn about books is asking other people what they recommend. Um, so I think um, keep reading everybody and uh, Kindle, hardcover, whatever. Um, you can learn so much from books. Thank you so much. Great recommendation. I will definitely check them out. Well, we are have this great opportunity to interview you, to have you on our show, Dean McQuaid. 
international educator, my professor, our mentor, and our leader at U of M. And thank you so much for your time. And uh, I, I just uh, couldn't thank you enough for everything for the past 30 years. You, <laughs> That's have, hard to believe. you have taught me <laughs> and taught my uh, classmates and taught my uh, colleagues at U of M and the, uh, in the community. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. And uh, I look forward to uh, catching up with you when I return to the Twin Cities. Thank, Thank you, you Chang. Time. This has been a lot of fun, and it's just always a pleasure to to talk to you. And we're just extremely proud of you being a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School. So thank you. I'm lucky. Thank you, Dima Green. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.